Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Media Live on TV3. I am Portia Gabo. Coming up this afternoon, Chairman of Opposition National Democratic Congress, NDC, Samuel Ofusu Ampofu, expected at CID headquarters today. Coming up in international news, head of major medical research charity Welcome Trust calls latest outbreak of Ebola in Central Africa truly frightening. We first begin from the Ashanti region, where residents of Kenya say in the Kwabwe East District are still in shock a day after suspected kidnappers were arrested in the community. A team of security personnel Wednesday morning rescued two Canadians who had been abducted for over a week. Kofi Edu Donfer took a trip to the building where the rescue operation took place and has come through with this report. This building, even when we are here, we didn't suspect the uh, the, this thing, the rebels. We didn't suspect them here. But when we are here and then we hear about the soldiers are surrounding here. So we near here and hear what happened. Who owns this building? The building owner he was in Mortinia. But at now we don't know about this building because they take another building picture to him and send him to and telling him the building where they are building for him. But not knowing this building where they are building for him. But he don't know. At now we are talking. He don't know about this building. But yesterday we verify about the, this building, then we show him the building is for him. And then he don't know about this building by another building where they are showing the picture and uh, yesterday we call him and tell him about what happened here how worried are you as residents how well we are worried because we are uh, we are young guys here and then if god is not in the soldiers come and meet you there maybe you went some place and work coming back when they see you, they will take you because suspect. Because we all we are the same sizes, you know. And they will take you like you are part of them. Not knowing you are not part of them. You are from somewhere. And the area we are now, they are spoiling the area names because of kidnapping. They are kidnapped this one, uh, this guy. They kidnapped two Canadians. They spoiling the area name because now. You have children, they will go and go and find some work to work. When they ask them the place where they are, if they say they're from Achiansi, it's, it's difficult for them to take them. So that is the worry of a resident, Baba is his name. And a lot of people here are really concerned about the bad name. Away from the Ashanti region, let's now focus on this developing story. The chairman of the main opposition National Democratic Congress, Samuel Ufoso Ampofo, is expected to report to the police at the CID headquarters today. Samuel Ufoso Ampofo was on Tuesday evening granted bail after about five hours in police custody. The NDC chairman had refused to honor an invitation to the Director General of the Criminal Investigations Department to assist in investigations into the recent space of kidnappings across the country when he refused to report the police subsequently went to court to obtain an arrest warrant a suspect is reported to have accused the NDC party chairman of being behind the crimes a situation which informed the police to invite him for questioning the leadership of the NDC later on Tuesday issued a statement charging party supporters to remain calm Menor General Secretary of the NDC, Johnson Esiedu Nketa, on Tuesday evening said Chairman Ofusampofo went through a series of questioning in relation to some accusations leveled against him. Let's listen to him. They've asked all the questions they wanted answers for. They've searched the premises and residence of our national chairman. 
They've taken all his uh, communication gadgets with a promise, and we've offered to give them the password because we don't have anything to hide. And so, based on that, he's been granted bail. We've given them time to scan all the uh, electronic gadgets. And if they are satisfied, they can, they can now determine whether they, they have sufficient evidence to, take, to proceed further or to, to declare the, the, the case null and void. And so that is where we are now. It's been granted bail and we've executed the bail. Nobody should relent because our national, uh, uh, our national pledge and the national anthem urges every citizen to fight the oppressor's rule. We know the founding fathers of this country went through worse experiences than this. So if it is our time to bear the cross, we are ready to bear the cross. And let us assure everybody that nothing can break the resolve of a determined people. Yes. We are marching for victory yes. no, with or without uh, 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 this intimidation. And my colleague Godfrey Tanam is at the police headquarters where the NDC chairman Samuel Ufusampofo is expected to report today. So very soon we'll cross over to Godfrey Tanam to give us updates. Supposed to be. Uh, but we will be expecting Samuel of Osoampofo here, that is the NDC uh, national chairman here at 2 p.m., where he will go to the CID officials for further interrogation. What is that is going to happen today is that uh, on Tuesday, uh, Samuel of Osoampofo's um, two mobile phones and one uh, laptop computer were taken away from him. So uh, the CID is going to go into the uh, phones and then the, uh, mobile, uh, the, the laptop to make sure that he has no connection with the people who mentioned his name in connection with the kidnapping issues that have been happening here in the country. So that is exactly what is going to happen today. They're going to try to get access to Samuel Ofosu Ampofu's mobile phone and in the, the laptop to make sure that there's no any connection at all uh, with him and the people who have mentioned his name as uh, 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 those who have uh, embarked on some uh, kidnapping spree here at the CID headquarters. So exactly that is what is going to happen. And so far, no... Uh, party supporters have masked up here uh, but we cannot tell we cannot actually tell exactly what will happen when Samuel Fusu Ampofu arrives here whether the uh, supporters who mass up here like they did on Tuesday to show their solidarity to their party chairman so as it is right now everything is calm no security set up yet and uh, uh, the security we believe will set up uh, getting closer to 2 p.m. when Samuel Ofosu Ampofo will be coming. We will keep our eye on this particular issue and make sure that we give you details of whatever will happen here at the CID headquarters. From the CID headquarters, this has been Godfrey Tanam reporting for TV3 News. Thank you very much, Godfrey Tanam, for that update. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Let's now focus on sanitation and rubbish here, rubbish there, rubbish everywhere. Well, this may best describe the several tons of refuse dumped at Titegu in Accra every single day. Well, Joseph Armstrong Gold Alodbe reports the current situation in the Wage at Bawi municipality has deepened the challenges residents in the area face. The once muddy and flooded community in the Wejagbawe municipality has now become a dumping site. Young men and boys on their tricycles, loaded with waste, ride with enthusiasm as they dump their refuse. The arrival of the tricycles to the dumping site is as frequent as the flow of flood waters anytime the Wejag dam overflows. Their jaw is indicative of the appreciation to the chiefs and elders who they claim granted them the permission to use this place as a dumping site. <laughs> Among them is this 80-year-old boy who is equally busy helping his brother on the field. The site is some few meters from the Tetegu River which gets its source of water from the Wager Dam. The least flooding may result in all the waste ending up in the sea. 
currently yeah. are there. New Tetebu here in the Wajar Bari constituency, and then behind me is a group of people. I don't know. It looks like the place has been turned into a dumping site for refuse, but I'm sure that is not the case. So right with me here is one of the elders in this community. He wants to talk to us and give us further explanation as to what exactly is happening here. Why? The reason why we are doing this is this this place is being is a place where they take a clay and put out people that have taken out from here and the hole have been left down about 20 years ago. Even the depth of the, the hole is about 20 feet. Is the MCE in support for this? Yes, because he came, spoke, he spoke with the MCE, the MCE and he has agreed. He has agreed. And then even he has so I say if I go to the MCE's office now, the MCE will attest the fact that he's in support of this. Yes. From a distance, what looks like heaps of refuse turned out to be a food joint for the workers. Spaghetti mixed with eggs and vegetables prepared right at the center of the dumping site. Not far from them is another cooking joint, meant to be sold at the marketplace. They clearly see nothing wrong with cooking at the center of the dumping site. Some residents expressed their anger. It's really, really smelly, like it's smelly. And then flies are all over because of the same Then we those who live, let's say, behind it, or use the acid, you can't really pass because the bola is scattered. If the river overflows, all the rubbish will end up in the river. This is so wrong. I had a call to halt filming and report at the district chief's executive's office. Quite surprisingly, from the project coordinator to the director of environmental health and the DC's office was empty with nobody in sight to talk to. I later guarded the assembly member and some of her unit committee members have jointly petitioned the municipal assembly over the matter. But the assembly is yet to take any action. Joseph Armstrong Gould, Alogbe, TV3, Tetegu, Accra. On sanitation, the Federation of Plastic Manufacturers, Recyclers and Users has kicked against the move by a section of the public to get plastics banned in the country. At a news conference in Accra, the Federation said banning plastics is not the solution to a clean environment. Solomon Mensah has the details. Conference in Accra on Wednesday, the Federation said banning plastics is not a solution to a clean environment. The Federation's stance comes as many have called on government to get plastics banned in the country due to its negative effect on the environment, particularly the ocean. But the Federation of Plastic Manufacturers, Recyclers and Users say the issue at hand is not the plastics but human attitude. Daniel Toniga is the Director for Policy and Sustainability at the Federation. The issue is that we have an attitudinal challenge, a behavioral ch challenge in this nation. And that is what we must, you know, between the media and the industry, must all have that voice to say, our challenge is not the product, it's not the material, it's about the human being. Rather, let's ban our behaviors of indiscriminate littering. The Federation of Plastic Manufacturers, Recyclers and Users together with its partners will be holding a conference in Accra to brainstorm on the good uses of plastics. You're watching Media Live from the News Hub. The managing editor of the Insight newspaper, Kwesi Prat Jr., says the lack of sincerity among parties with Nkume's roots is the cause of their disunity. At the 70th anniversary launch of the formation of the Convention People's Party, CPP, in Accra, he said the parties have to galvanize their energies to unite. A report by Godfrey Tanam. 2019 is exactly 70 years the Convention People's Party was formed by the first president of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. After his formation in 1949, he spent about eight years in the fight for independence for the then Gold Coast. After independence, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah spent nine years in government before he was overthrown in February 1966. 
Since then, the Convention People's Party had not tested power, although it has contested all elections in the country under the Fourth Republic. <laughs> launch of the party's 70th anniversary, the managing news editor of the Inside newspaper, Kwesi Pratt Jr., advocated concrete works towards uniting the Nkrumah's parties. Yes, it is important for us to unite. And it is amazing that for more than 20 years, all our leaders said that we must unite and we never unite. Something must be wrong. And what must be wrong is the lack of sincerity in the call for unity. Why are we calling for unity instead of uniting? He expressed worry over what he described as an attempt to change Ghana's history. There is a strenuous effort to distort the history of Ghana. And sometimes, so-called Nkrumahis are part of that effort. Sometimes I hear people say that it is not only Nkrumah who fought for independence. Who has ever said that it is only Nkrumah who fought for independence? Nkrumah is the supremo. He is the inspiration of the independence movement. It is his ideas, his strength, his organizational ability who gave impetus to the struggle for independence. And indeed, on 6 March 1957, when independence was being declared, he declared it. He also took the opportunity to relaunch the convention newspaper. The acting chair of the party, Haji Hamda to Ibrahim, said the party is poised to get back on its feet. I am therefore issuing a clarion call to all of us to mobilize the entire CPP and in an event more confident advance towards the goal of building a vibrant, prosperous political party in all respects. On the morning of June 11, the CPP hosted a breakfast for some marginalized children at a Kral Psychiatric Hospital that giving hope to the deprived and abandoned children with disabilities. The 2016 flag bearer of the Convention People's Party, Ivor Green Street, said Ghana has less to show in terms of development after the overthrow of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. We have gone backwards and that we are not moving forwards in the way that we should do or in the way that the resources we have as a nation should allow us to. The year-long anniversary is on the theme, building consensus through tolerance and sincerity. So the CPP is 70 years. Let's talk to Dr. Edward Brinya. He is a senior lecturer at the Department of History and Political Studies at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology and joins me on phone from Kumasi. And Doc, 70 years of the existence of the CPP, yet the party has performed abysmally in recent polls. As a political scientist, what is the root cause of the issue? Um, good afternoon, good afternoon I think that um, the CPC as a political party needs to be united. Um, mm. There is no way they are going to be able to forge ahead to become a formidable party in Ghana if they keep on dividing their funds. Mm. So it, it is a matter of they coming together as a youth and also putting up policies that are attractive to the youth. You look at if um, many in the CPP saw dancing the greens of the mm. yesterday, uh, yes, those of Kwame Kuma and others, I think they need to be united, put out policy that will attract the youth. And now that a lot of people in Ghana are sort of yearning for a third party, if they can come together, they should be able to become a formidable force. Aside unity, what else can the CPP do to attract a lot more voters to be a credible political party? Um, that's what I said. Uh, putting up things that are attractive to the youth. If you look at the membership, if you look as if uh, it still remains those that were part of the CDP in the days, right, the elders and others, and I believe strongly that if they are putting up policies that are attractive to the youth, then of course, uh, maybe for the party in one way or other, making it um, uh, interest or motivating for you to even contest for elections, in one way or the other, they should be able to attract the numbers. Hmm. Now, Doc, looking at their performance in the 2016 elections, even with smaller political parties, they even scored less than 1%. So can they really merge together to gain more votes? It's about the problem that they've been confronted with, the disunity, struggling for power. And those are the main problems. So until 
they realize that they are not going to be able to move ahead and become a stronger party if they don't mm. actually unite. It, uh, it, uh, it, uh, I mean, it's going to get worse. But if they should actually uh, bury their differences, unite and fight as a single party, they could make a difference in Ghana's politics. Now, Doc, before you go, what are their chances in the 2020 polls? I'm sorry? What are their chances in the 2020 polls? It would all depend on the, their, um, I mean, the, uh, what do I say, on their uniting. If they don't unite, they might even perform worse than they did in the last election. Thank you very much for your time. I've been speaking to Dr. Edward Brinya. He is a senior lecturer at the Department of History and Political Studies at KNUSD. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Coming up is the MTN Video Report. And today, our citizen journalist Peter Seshi from Sang in the Mion District of the Northern Region takes his turn. This is St. Anthony. Catholic Primary School in Sang in the Mion district of the Northern Region. These are the ripped off roof of the school. The children are just loitering about. You can see some of the debris around. When teachers come to school, they sit under the tree with the children without any effective teaching and learning taking place. That is the pavilion. It is also down where children have been buying their food. Specifically, that's the canteen of the school. This is Peter Sechi reporting from Mio District of the Northern Region. Thank you very much, Peter, for that report. So like Peter, you can also send your video reports via WhatsApp on the number 055-1433-044. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. We have more news coming up shortly. Do stay with us. You're still watching Midday Live from the News Hub. Now, last month, Amnesty International Ghana wrote to the Criminal Investigations Department of the Ghana Police Service for permission to visit Gregory Afoko. And the move came in the wake of a petition submitted to the organization over Afoko's continuous detention. Despite being granted bail by the Criminal Division of an Accra High Court, Gregory Afoko has been standing trial since 2015 for allegedly killing the then NPP Upper East Regional Chairman. Adams Mahama. This afternoon, Robert Akotamwafu, who is director of Amnesty International Ghana, joins me in the studio. Thanks for your time. So it's been days since you requested to see Gregory Afoko. Have you been able to see him? No, it's been three weeks. Um, so we wrote um, on the 27th um, of last month to um, the CID to be able to get access just to have an, an, an information with him, just to seek some more information about the petition that has been submitted to us. And that has taken us three weeks. Um, which is very terrible. It tells a very bad image on our police service. Um, the kind of feedback we are getting from the CID seem to be something that just to be throwing that off. What have they told you? I mean, they have told us one. One of the issues was okay. The person in charge of this of the of the um, of the division is not around. Um, um, COP Tiwa is not around. Mm -hmm. um, now she came back. She said now she has to check with them, the uh, attorney general. Oh. Um, to see if um, they can give us access because there's another case of contempt against him. We are like, no, we are not dealing with the case. As an independent Amnesty International NGO, we are just seeking information from the person mm -hmm. who is in your custody. We are not going to interfere with any case. We are not going to. All we are seeking is information and audience with this individual. So we, it's quite worrying that up mm -hmm. to, for up to three weeks now, we've not been able to. And it is not like we have go send the letter and we're going to sit down waiting. We are following up every day, mm. following up to check when we can see him. What will be the impact on Ghana's image? It's, it will be very telling, it will be very bad, because over the past few years, our human rights records seem to be going to this level of where 
impunity is taking place and we are not having access like for instance this is a bad uh, image on our on, on our police service and even this is a human rights issue somebody having access to bail so if we really want to show the world that really we respect the rights of people having access to bail we will give the opportunity for independent human rights organizations like us who have no um, issue with the case we have no role to play in this case just to make sure that the right thing is done that is what we are seeking what for. will be your next line of action so currently what we are doing is we are at the office at the moment we are writing to the attorney general because um, the cid had has mentioned to us that um the issue the attorney general has to give her permission to give us to see um a focal so we are writing the attorney general we are also preparing um to go to court um and to for habeas corpus mm -hmm. because if we want to see the person and you are preventing us from seeing the person we will let the court order you mm -hmm. to produce a body that's mm -hmm. so that we can speak to him oh. Yes. Thank you very much for You're your welcome. time. I've been speaking to Robert Akutama, who he is director of Amnesty International Ghana. Thanks once again for your time. You're still watching Ready Life on the News app. Coming up as the latest in the world of business. Coming up in business this afternoon, the Chamber of Petroleum Consumers Ghana, COPEC, has given a seven-day ultimatum to oil marketing companies caught in adjusting pumps to under-deliver fuel to customers to come out with measures to stop this practice. The executive director of COPEC, Duncan Amwa, has called for stiffer punishment for fuel stations found to have adjusted their fuel pumps in a bid to cheat customers. deterrent enough to these fuel stations that adjust their pumps and cheat the public. Uh, we believe that the time comes when uh, the persons who engage in these technical manipulation of the pumps uh, should be prosecuted and be probably, I mean, sent to jail if we can, so as to forestall the recurrence of this incident. It is not proper for a consumer to get to a filling station uh, because he cannot see what is being pumped into his tank, uh, he should be underserved or the pump should under deliver. We know instances where some of the pumps also over deliver. Either way is not correct. But we think that some of the dealers have become a pain in the neck of consumers. And we think the OMCs who have been mentioned or named. This is the time to demonstrate to the Ghanaian that indeed they are on top of their game within the next seven days. Uh, they will be able to put measures in place so that next year we do not come back with the same report where uh, some pumps have been adjusted, seals broken and all of that. The sanctions we insist should be punitive and deterrent enough. The 5,000 hasn't solved anything. That is why the, 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 the stink uh, still remains with us. Again, uh, we are also saying going forward that we have given these OMC is a seven-day ultimatum to ensure that they come back to tell every Ghanaian who may have patronized these stations that have been mentioned measures and steps they have put in place to ensure that these stations and other stations who may not have been caught yet do not get to the practice of uh, shortchanging the unsuspecting public. Anything else will be forced to send some of these OMCs not only to court, but would also advise the public to boycott them effectively. In other news, spare parts dealers at Abusokai say they are still not enjoying any form of benefits from a reduction in the benchmark valuation of imports two months after its announcements. Chairman of the Abusokai Spare Parts Dealers Association, Clement Boatin, says the Ghana Revenue Authority must explain why spare parts have been exempted from the policy, though the vice president was emphatic that it was across board. The vice president in April this year at the maiden town hall meeting on the economy organized by the economic management team announced a reduction in the benchmark valuation of import effective April 4. The benchmark valuation for general goods has been slashed by 50% while that of vehicles has also seen a 30% reduction. The move, according to Dr. Mamou Dubamia, is to ensure an increase in the volume of import through Ghana's port instead of through neighboring countries. It is also to make Ghana's port competitive. Chairman of the Aboso Kind Spare Part Dealers Association, Clement Boatin, bemoaned the exclusion of spare part in the benchmark valuation. A meeting was uh, supposed to have taken place last uh, Monday. Mm -hmm. Yes, we were supposed to you know, have a meeting uh, last Monday you know, to 
uh, bring to the finality of this issue. But unfortunately, the meeting couldn't come on. So as I'm talking to you now, we are waiting uh, for them to, you know, give us uh, another appointment for us to go and meet and then trust this issue once up and for all. Because as I'm talking to you now, we are still not enjoying that benchmark reduction as announced by the vice president. He said her spare parts been included, the public would have enjoyed a reduction of between 20 to 30 percent on wares. If we are not part of the reduction, how do we reduce our goals? And if you made the public, you know, to know that uh, we are part, whilst we are not part of it. So it's a false information. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's, it's a false information. Meanwhile, the association is upbeat of a positive outcome after a planned meeting with the Ghana Revenue Authority. 13 microfinance institutions affected by the cleanup exercise have petitioned the Bank of Ghana for further engagement since they were given a period to clean their books. The Executive Secretary of the Microfinance Institutions Network, Yao Jinfi, who made the disclosure, said the magnitude of the number of institutions closed down has created a case of mistaken identity for the relatively solvent ones. 137 microfinance companies remain active following the revocation of the licenses of the 347 of them. Poor corporate governance practices led to poor lending practices and high non-performing loans with the consequential capital deficits, according to the statement by the central bank. Persons entitled to claims for many of the collapsed microfinance companies have begun processes to access their funds with the completion of validation of claims by the receiver. Eric Nananipa of PricewaterhouseCoopers, Executive Director of the Microfinance Institutions Network, Yao Jemfi says the magnitude of the number of institutions closed down has created a case of mistaken identity for the relatively solvent ones, which has led to further panic withdrawals. We've come to a stage to uh, see what it entails, and then we are working on a few things to get back to the central bank cards too for some of our members who we find them in. Uh, some were given some time to work on what ABCD, and we anticipate that they are on course. So those ones, uh, why should they be part of this? Um, we are yet to receive any further things, but what we are also doing on the ground is to um, collate all this kind of um, information from the various people who have been affected. For his part, Chief Executive Officer of Dalex Finance, Ken Thompson, says, although the exercise has saved the depositors their funds, small businesses which depend on the sector for credit will not be spared the impact of the closure of the microfinance companies. I think of the job losses uh, that are going with it, the direct and indirect losses. In a country where unemployment is high, in a country where uh, dependency on people that are employed is very high, it makes me very sad. But even then, it's even the supplies, those are supply food, those supply paper, those supply water, all those people are affected. Then um, I'm happy for the depositors. I'm happy for the depositors uh, because hopefully they can get at least their principal back. I'm sad, really sad for um, the people, you know, our mothers in the villages, you know, who depend on some form of credit to do their business. Apart from the affected microfinance companies, 39 microcredit institutions also had their licenses revoked by the central bank. Registrar General Jemima Owari, who is the official liquidator for the collapsed microcredit institutions, says the winding up of the affected companies has commenced. And that's it for Midday Thanks so much for watching. I am Portia Gabo. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.